Baltimore with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Uh, if I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, August 27th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. It's one of our famous vacation pre-tape shows. You still get content even when we're not doing the show. How does that work? This is what normal shows do. They pre-record, they give the podcast out, that's it, boom, bang, boom, in YouTube shows too. Nobody else does it live every day for three hours. We do. But then there's this sense of like, oh, is this a letdown because it's a pre-recorded show? No. It's a fascinating uh, story written by Steve Olson, science writer author of The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age. Talks about basically the development of plutonium. Um, We recorded it on the anniversary, or very close to the anniversary of, I believe it was Nagasaki bombing, or maybe it was Hiroshima. I mean, those obviously were a couple days apart, and I can't remember exactly. We recorded it about a a week or two ago. Um... And uh, there were actually two different types of bombs that were dropped. Um, Plutonium was one of the bombs. But uh, I will leave that to the science writer to explain uh, all that to you. Um, We are uh, still on vacation. Uh, Nomi is doing a recap of the RNC, which even though I am speaking in the past, I know is uh, a crap show. And I, to a certain extent, I'm regretting, you know, not, um, not mocking it in real time, but, um, ugh, let's just, let's just do this election. Let's get this going. Shall we folks? In the meantime, um, uh, check out Nomi's show, uh, YouTube.com, the Nomi Key Show. Find that on YouTube. We'll put a link into uh, the link is obviously in the podcast uh, description of this and in the uh, YouTube description of this. So uh, check it out. Um, and uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow with another interview with Sayward Darby. She did a, um, uh, a book about um, three women who were in um, white supremacy movement. A little disturbing but interesting, fascinating. Uh, So we're going to take a quick break right now. When we come back, Steve Olson, The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program a uh, journalist and writer and author of The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age. Steve Olson, welcome to the program. Thanks very much. Uh, so uh, we are uh, actually talking on the um, anniversary of the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. Uh, and um, the the book you have written is uh, about one element of the development of, of our uh, in many respects, our nuclear age, in addition to the bombs. Uh, and it is one of the, the key elements. In fact, um, I think you call it the single most important site of the nuclear age. Uh, and you, the book you've written is, in many respects, about what you call the, the humanity's greatest intellectual achievements uh, 
uh, but also moral blindness, which could destroy us all. So let's, I guess, start with just the implications of the 75th anniversary. Yes, there are commemorative events going on all day today to mark the 75th anniversary of uh, the bombing of Hiroshima. My book is actually even more about the bombing of Nagasaki, and the 75th anniversary of that is this Sunday, and there will be commemorative events all that day as well. Uh, and 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 your book is more about the, the bombing of Nagasaki because of why? Uh, because uh, the bombs, two bombs dropped on Japan use two different kinds of materials that can be used to make atomic bombs. Scientists realized uh, right after the discovery of fission in 1938 that you could make an atomic bomb using a rare isotope of uranium. And they produced that isotope during the Manhattan Project at a huge factory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. But my book is about the uh, other material that you can use to make an atomic bomb, and that's plutonium. Plutonium wasn't discovered until 1941, just a few months before Pearl Harbor. And I argue in the book that that's actually the reason the Manhattan Project got started is because with the discovery of plutonium by a scientist at the University of California, Berkeley, all of a sudden there were two ways to build an atomic bomb. And if we had two ways to build an atomic bomb, then the Germans did as well. So that's the, what's the reason, the original, original reason for the Manhattan Project was to build an atomic bomb to counter the possibility that the Germans could build one first. Um, and, and just, uh, you, I mean, you, rec- you retrace the history a little bit. I mean, we've, we've touched upon this, uh, just a bit in the past on this program. Uh, but, but will you just outline for us a couple of the major players involved in the Manhattan project, uh, and just some of its basic history? Sure. The people that I profile in my book, uh, number one is the man who discovered plutonium, a man named Glenn Seaborg at the University of California, Berkeley. He was doing research on, just fundamental scientific research on heavy elements like uranium, and discovered that if he added a neutron uh, to a the most common isotope of uranium, he would create um, this new element uh, over the course of just a few days. Uh, you know, normally, this would have been the most one of the most important scientific discoveries of the 20th century, and it was. Normally, it would have been splashed across headlines everywhere. But uh, Seaborg and other scientists realized quite quickly that uh, this element plutonium could be used to build atomic bombs. So he's he's one of the characters in my book. And Seaborg was a fascinating scientist who was really active throughout um, the from the 1940s until the 1990s. He became head of the Atomic Energy Commission, was involved in many of the developments of the Cold War. And even after the Cold War, he was active in making decisions about America's nuclear weapon program. Uh, the other person who I feature in my book is the Italian f- physicist Enrico Fermi, because to make enough plutonium to build an atomic bomb would require not only uranium ore, but lots of neutrons, because you had to add neutrons to that uranium to make plutonium. And the only way to develop lots of neutrons is in a nuclear reactor. So in 1941, when Seaborg discovered plutonium, he just made minuscule amounts, amounts that you couldn't even see in a microscope. Uh, you could just detect them using radiation detectors. But Fermi at the University of at, at Columbia University was working on a device that would become a nuclear reactor. And uh, scientists quickly put the two together. They said, if we take plutonium from one side of the United States and this nuclear reactor that Enrico Fermi is working on the other side of the United States, we could build essentially industrial facilities to make enough plutonium to build an atomic weapon. And that was that industrial facility was the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Uh, the site for that was chosen in 1942. And I just happened to grow up in a small town about 15 miles away from Hanford. Um, and this is up so in Washington. That's where I got interested. This is in Washington State. And I want to I want to get yeah. to the the sort of the experience of growing up in there. But give us a sense of just like, you know, when we talk about um, uh, uh, Fermi, and we talk about Seaborg. Um, I mean, obviously, um, you know, uh, Leslie Groves, the, the general who oversaw uh, much of this project, um, was was aware. But like how at, at what point do these scientists become conscious of exactly what they're building? Both like I mean, I think, you know, from uh, conscious of the, the, the project itself but also conscious of the implications of what they're building. It's very interesting. Leslie Groves is the third major character of my book as the man who drove the Manhattan Project. But there's another character who I talk quite a bit about in my book, uh, 
a man named Leo Szilard, another emigre scientist who moved from Europe to the United States um, just a, around the same time that Enrico Fermi did, and in fact was involved with Fermi in building a nuclear reactor. And Leo Szilard was the very first person to conceive of the possibility of a nuclear chain reaction way back in the early 1930s. And he recognized, Szilard's a very interesting character in this entire history because he recognized from the very beginning of the, the dangers that this discovery would pose to human beings. He was both excited about the technology and thought that it needed to be developed. He was very afraid that the Nazis would develop a bomb before the United States. But from the very beginning, he was warning about the dangers to humanity if this technology were developed. And he continued those warnings throughout World War II, even while being involved in the development of the bomb at the University of Chicago. It's a place called the Met Lab, which is also where Seaborg worked. So uh, um, Szilard, Seaborg, uh, Fermi, and Leslie Groves, they're all tied up together in this really interesting human story as the bomb is being developed. And, and I think uh, at one point, if I remember correctly, Szilard uh, said... Um, something to the effect of it was really just like um, it, it, it was sort of a damned if we do damned um, just a little bit more if we don't type of situation. If we don't. That's true. And, you know, but he also tried to control the ways in which the bomb would be used. So since we're talking on the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima bombing, Szilard, in the summer of 1945, as the decisions were being made about how and whether to use the bomb, uh, put together a group of scientists at the University of Chicago, and uh, they developed a, a report uh, directed to U.S. policymakers that urged them not to use the bomb on Japanese citizens, but rather to have a demonstration project or in some other way to make the Japanese government aware of the fact that we had the bomb and see if that would be enough to induce the Japanese to surrender in the war. So, so Szilard was hoping that the just simply the threat of the existence of the weapons would cause the Japanese to surrender. I mean, we're getting maybe a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but the, um, I mean, there's a lot of controversy, it seems to me, about um, the necessity to have dropped certainly, um, I, I mean, both of the bombs. I mean, uh, there's obviously controversy about Hiroshima, but I think there's even increasing um there's even more controversy about Nagasaki. And um, in, in both instances, it's unclear that there was an immediate need to drop these bombs. I mean, so what after the fact? Um, and, I, and I also want to talk about the different materials that are used in the two bombs, because I, I wonder if that wasn't also a factor as to why these bombs were dropped, uh, at least the second one, uh, to basically, you know, do a live test on some level uh, or a live show. But what is your sense of, of how these uh, scientists perceived it uh, after the fact? Well, there was quite a bit of discussion during the summer of 1945 among scientists themselves about the ways in which the bomb should be used. And the Szilard, the committee on which Szilard served, in which uh, that advocated not dropping the bomb on civilians, but rather doing a demonstration shot, was probably the most visible of the discussions that were taking place. And opinions were divided even among the scientists. Some felt that there was no way that a demonstration shot could be carried out because, oh, for instance, the Japanese would move American prisoners in there, or what if the shot didn't work? Uh, then it's possible that the um, uh, that the war could have continued for even longer. There were a number of objections uh, to doing it that way. Now, uh, after the bombs were used, um, it became clear that uh, some of the considerations about not dropping the bomb, that perhaps enough consideration had been given to that option, and some of the scientists uh, felt that that they were sort of caught up in uh, technological momentum to use the bombs and to use both bombs. But, you know, when you look at the history of it and the way in which this decision was actually made, the scientists themselves had very little influence and could have had very little influence over how the bombs were used. Once those bombs were built, it's difficult to conceive of a set of circumstances that would have led to them not being dropped. You're, you're right that Leslie Groves, the, man, the head of the Manhattan Project, was very interested and interested 
believed from the beginning that two bombs had to be used, that the first bomb could demonstrate that the United States could make atomic bombs, and the second one would demonstrate that we could keep making atomic bombs and keep dropping them on Japan until Japan surrendered. Now, Groves had an additional reason for using those two bombs, which is that he had invested $2 billion of government funds into these two different ways of making atomic bombs, one with uranium from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and the second with plutonium from the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington State. And he certainly was interested in demonstrating that both of those approaches worked. And, and, and we should say, I mean, because I think it's just important that, you know, when we talk about this stuff and so it's so abstract, we're talking about the deaths of hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of, of women and children. I mean, largely, um, you know, and, and sometimes I think it's like it, 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 it's easy to sort of see it as, you know, these are about machines only, um, but it had obviously... Um, massive moral and and human implications. So, all right. So, Hanford or Hanford, I should say. Um, what what why that location? And, and tell us just sort of like the the physicality of what was built there. I mean, and then we'll we'll talk about the sort of the the problem of the physicalities that were built there. Uh, yes, a, a colonel in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was sent out to Oregon and Washington, well, actually to the West Coast in general. He also looked at a couple of potential sites in California to find a site that had that met certain demands. He needed a lot of cold water to cool off the nuclear reactors because these were going to be large nuclear reactors that would be built. He needed electricity, and Grand Coulee Dam had just come online uh, the year before, so there was electricity at the site. He needed a rail line to haul the equipment to the site, and that happened to be there. Um, but most of all, he needed a site that was isolated, that didn't have too many people that would have to be removed from the site. And there were about 1,500 or so people living in the area that he chose. And he wanted it to be far away from any large cities so that if something went wrong with the reactor or with the other facilities built at the site, not too many people would be killed. And uh, he was flying over this uh, sort of a, a, a large, arid desert plain in South Central Washington State, and the second he saw it, he said, "This is it. Uh, it just has everything we need." Uh, there was there was no uh, no doubt about it. In fact, he flew General Groves out there a couple of uh, weeks later and said, "Don't you agree that this is the perfect site?" And Groves said, "Yes, it is." So that's why the Hanford site was built. Uh, it's um, it, during during World War II. There were three nuclear reactors built at the Hanford site. Uh, these were the first large scale nuclear reactors built anywhere in the world. So all nuclear reactors since then are based on technologies that were developed at Hanford. So the, uh, the, the sites are built there and then the, the issue becomes, you know, what do you do with the byproducts? Um, tell us about the massive auditorium sized underground tanks that were built and what the thinking was behind the, the, the storage of these byproducts. Yeah, the tanks, the tank waste, which we're still dealing with today. Well, to make plutonium, it's a two-step process. You first of all take uranium ore and you put it into a nuclear reactor, and some of the uranium atoms are transformed into plutonium. But then you have to get the plutonium out of those uranium fuel elements. And that was done at Hanford in these gigantic windowless concrete buildings. The workers called them Queen Marys because they were the size of ocean liners, these, these massive concrete constructions that rise from the middle of the desert. And essentially, they were gigantic chemical processing plants. You put the uranium fuel elements in one end of the plant, and the plutonium would be chemically separated out from the uranium, and a tiny little dribble of plutonium would come out the far end of that plant. But you needed massive quantities of chemicals to be able to, to do that process. And when you use that process in those reprocessing plants, uh, those chemicals would also become highly radioactive. Well, the people that were operating Hanford, both during the Manhattan Project and during the Cold War, we can talk about that because Hanford uh, greatly expanded after World War II, uh, they, they figured, well, you know, we have a war to win. We've got, um, we're fighting the Germans, we're fighting the Japanese, now we're fighting the Soviets. Uh, we'll let future generations figure out what to do with these highly radioactive chemicals. So they started building gigantic tanks. They, they would dig a hole in the ground, put 12 or 16 of these tanks, build 12 or 16 of them, 
uh, cover up the tanks with the sand and dirt from the desert, and then start pumping these highly radioactive chemicals into those tanks. Those tanks had design lifetimes of 20 years. Uh, and the Department of Energy, though it has made progress in cleaning up some portions of Hanford, is just starting to deal with the chemicals in those tanks now, 75 years, after, more than 75 years after we started filling those tanks up with these highly radioactive chemicals. It's really the, the most radiologically contaminated site in the Western Hemisphere. The, 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 uh, Russia has a similar site where they made the plutonium for their atomic bombs, um, and, and those are pretty much the two most contaminated sites in the world. And, and 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 to be clear, these these tanks are the size of like a like a small auditorium, a big auditorium, oh, no, a large one. Yeah, a large one. There's 177 of those tanks sitting underground, and they have 56 million gallons of these chemicals in them. No, it's a huge problem. It's going to take hundreds of billions of dollars and decades to clean up the material in those tanks. So, I mean, walk us through, like you know. At what point do they, does someone say, hey, you know, remember those tanks? They're supposed to last only 20 <laughs> years, and it's been 22 years, guys. Um, like, you know, it, it, I mean, I, at that point, we're in the, the sort of the right in the sort of, the, I guess, the, the peak of the Cold War uh, by that point, right? I mean, we're talking like in the early 60s. Um, and what, uh, I, I mean, what, what, what is the theory at that point? Yeah, well, they noticed that they should start dealing with the tanks when the tanks started leaking and some of these radioactive chemicals started entering the, the soil underneath the tanks and making their way toward the Columbia River. But, you know, we should talk just a little bit about the Cold War because it's really interesting Please. what happened at the end of World War II. Uh, you know, uh, it was even, even when the Hiroshima bomb was being dropped 75 years ago today, people realized that they weren't going to make that kind of bomb anymore. It was really a technological one-off, that bomb. It used a huge amount of uranium. 10 times more than the amount of plutonium in the Nagasaki bomb. And it was a very dangerous bomb. It was very easy to set that bomb off accidentally. So even by the end of World War II, people realized that when we build future nuclear weapons, we're going to be using plutonium. And so all of our bombs today uh, have a small pit of plutonium, essentially a small Nagasaki bomb at their center. And it was the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, along with a second site in South Carolina, that made all of that plutonium for our, for our nuclear weapons. And and that and that plutonium is just simply less volatile. Is that it? Uh, well, the reason it's used in nuclear weapons is it's more powerful than uranium, uh, so you get more bang for your buck uh, doing it that way. And the, it, it's it's easier to make. Um, at the end of World War II, Groves was ready to drop a third bomb on Japan, and that bomb would have been would have used plutonium from Hanford. Uh, that bomb was ready to ship across the Pacific when Truman said, no, we're not going to use any more nuclear weapons on Japan. This was even before the surrender. Uh, he, he didn't like the idea of killing all those uh, children. So uh, he put an end to the nuclear bombing. And that third bomb, using plutonium from Hanford, never was shipped from the United States. Um, and so the uh, Hanford got a lot more, I guess, activity through the Cold War. I mean, what what did I'm just curious as to the mentality of the scientists. Right. I mean, at one point it starts to become clear what they have unleashed. And I'm curious as to like, you know, what how these scientists dealt with that. Yes, uh, during the Cold War, six more nuclear reactors were built at Hanford and several more chemical processing plants. So the large majority of these radioactive chemicals were, uh, were developed in the Cold War. And there were scientists that were monitoring that situation. I mean, it, you can think of it, it's, it's comparable to a situation today. They thought they had immediate concerns that required the generation of this plutonium. I mean, my grandfather worked at a steam fitter at Hanford, and so I, I know what that mentality is. They said, we've got a job to do, and we've got to get this done, and, sort of, and people will deal with the consequences later. Well, today, uh, through our daily lives and activities, we are putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere using the same mentality, right? Which is that, uh, well, we, we sort of need to live, live our lives and we know that this carbon dioxide is gonna cause catastrophic climatic effects in the future, but we're just gonna have to leave it to future generations 
to figure out how to deal with that. And so we're not, we're not, we're, and you know, I sort of think the mentality in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s at Hanford might have been the same. They might have said, sure, we're generating these chemicals, but there's, there's going to be a way to deal with it. People will engineer solutions to be able to, to um, um, isolate these chemicals from the environment. And in fact, there is a solution. We can clean it up. It's just going to take a huge amount of money, and it's going to take a, bit, a commitment from the federal government for decades to get it done to not have those materials sitting there threatening uh, everybody downriver in the Columbia River, millions of people who could be exposed to those radioactive chemicals if the tanks start leaking in a serious way. Um, how, how would we go about um, uh, cleaning that? I mean, is it, is it you know, uh, yeah. find a mountain to bury it in? or what? Like, what? That, a couple, couple steps before that. You know, my son's an environmental engineer, and so I watch this process a lot of, you know, just these hideously contaminated industrial sites. And there are all kinds of technologies that people aren't familiar with, but if enough money is spent on them, you can you can really clean up uh, even very serious messes. And of course, this is one of our most serious messes. It's interesting the process that the Department of Energy is developing to be able to handle these wastes. And they've successfully done this in other places, including that South Carolina plant that made plutonium. You take the waste and you mix it with sand in... In, uh, a vi- in, in very high temperatures, and you essentially create these glass logs. It's called vitrification. And then the highly radioactive waste is immobilized inside of these glass logs. Now, you're right. We don't have any place to put these glass logs because we don't have a repository for high-level nuclear waste in this country anywhere. So even when they're in glass logs, they'll just be sitting at the Hanford site waiting for a, a deep repository to be built. But it'll still be better than those chemicals sitting in those tanks. And what of, I mean, as at least some of this material has leaked over the years, there's, uh, you write that there were, uh, were periods where there was, uh, uh, increases in cancers. Um, what, I, I mean, uh, what, what has been the, um, uh, the environmental, I guess, and the, um, the health implications for people living in and around Hanford? That's an interesting and difficult question to answer. I lived up, I, I lived just 15 years, uh, 15 miles away from Hanford uh, and grew up there. And so I'm a downwinder. All of the people who lived with me, my family members are downwinders. I know lots of people in what's called the Tri Cities, uh, the three cities that are closest to Hanford. They have been exposed to these uh, radioactive contaminants over the years. Um, when when someone in your family gets sick and you live near Hanford, it's certainly a logical conclusion to draw is that that sickness is somehow related to the, the radioactive exposures that we had. Uh, and, and that's an important piece of information. We have to take that into account in trying to assess the health effects of Hanford. But there is another kind of information. I'm a, I'm a science writer, and I, I believe in science as a way of the best way that we can have of knowing things. And scientists have studied the populations around Hanford very carefully, or as carefully as they can. There are always limitations in these kinds of epidemiological studies. And they have not found evidence of huge increases or of large increases of health effects, cancers, and other problems in surrounding populations. Now, I have no doubt that there are individuals who have been affected uh, by um, radioactive releases from Hanford. But do I think that uh, my exposures as a child uh, are going to cause me health problems? They might. My personal conclusion is that the risks that I faced, and I was lucky some people faced greater risks, are small. And I, I would go to the Tri-Cities today without any reservations, despite the fact that there's plenty of radioactivity there. But it's closely monitored. A lot of that radioactivity is uh, in those tanks and is not being released. Uh, the leaks are not large. Uh, there are not large amounts of material that are getting into the Columbia River. We have to deal with it because if we don't, the exposures will be much greater. But you know, there, we face lots of risks in our lives, and everybody has to make decisions about those risks. I personally choose to believe that the risks that I receive from Hanford are small. What? Um, how, how much... And it, 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 at different points, was there an awareness of what was going on at Hanford by uh, folks who lived in the area? I mean, it is 
it's one thing to say I'm going to choose to, you know, take these risks. It's another if you don't know what the risks are. Yes, and there wasn't much awareness. You're exactly right about that. The people in the area weren't told about these radioactive releases. The people who were running Hanford felt that it would just uh, create a needless uh, concern among the people in the area if they were continually told that there were uh, radioactive gases and radioactive water that was being released into the Columbia River. Now, the people who were running Hanford may very well have believed that the amount of radiation being released did not pose a serious health risk. That is a, th that question is hard. It's hard to figure out exactly what they were thinking back in the 1950s and 1960s. But you're absolutely right that the people in the area were not told and given that uh, the ability to make a choice about whether or not they wanted to be exposed to the radioactivity that was coming out of those plants. Well, at what point did they become more aware of it? Uh, you know, by the 1970s or so, at which point we had 30,000 nuclear weapons, all of them built around a little pit of plutonium, and, and Russia had 40,000 nuclear weapons. And we realized this was just insane. Uh, we, we had at that point a million times the firepower of the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So these countries had, had, had way more plutonium than they would ever need. As the Cold War ended and as we started uh, instituting arms control agreements, the number of weapons dropped and they began having taking plutonium out of these weapons and putting it on the shelf, it's sitting on the shelf down at the Pantex plant in Texas. At that point, we didn't really have a need for any more plutonium, nor did, nor did the Soviet Union or later Russia. Uh, in fact, we have too much of it. We need to get rid of some of this material. And there are debates that have been going on for decades about how to dispose of this plutonium, because if a, if a terrorist or some other group were to access that plutonium, uh, it would be a, a very serious threat uh, to, to people everywhere. So at that point, both Hanford and the corresponding facility in the Soviet Union were shut down. And uh, the, the nuclear reactors were turned off. The processing plants were, uh, were shuttered. And, and at that point, that's when the Department of Energy and the U.S. government realized, wow, we have a terrible mess on our hands that we're going to have to deal with. And, and by about the 1980s, the attention at Hanford shifted from plutonium production to the cleanup of not only the processing plants and the tank waste, but there were all kinds of contaminated equipment, um, just, a, just a mess that had been sort of dumped into trenches and covered with dirt over the decades. And there was no possible way that we could just leave that there because eventually those contaminants were going to find their way into the Columbia River. So we've been cleaning that area up for the past three decades. Um, were there were there were there lawsuits when people like found out what they had maybe been exposed to? Was there attempts at looking at that? I'm curious as to, you know, just what the reaction was. I, I imagine if I'm I don't know. 35 years old, I've got a 10 year old kid, let's say, and I've been growing up in this area. And then it gets announced to me like, oh, incidentally, by the way, we have a tremendous amount of some of the most um, radioactive material uh, in any concentrated area in the world. And some of it's been leaking a little bit into the river. I, I, I mean, I think my reaction would be uh, one of, of just abject horror. Well, especially if you're sick. Or if your child is sick, or if both of you are sick, and there were plenty of instances in which that occurred uh, in this area. So yes, you're right, absolutely. There were thousands of lawsuits filed by downwinders uh, with various health problems who contended that Hanford had been the cause of, that, of those health problems. And these wended their way through the courts for decades as people tried to decide on this. There's actually a, a good book that was just released called the, the Hanford Downwinders, which recounts the long history of people trying to be compensated by the federal government for the for the health fix that they attributed to Hanford. You know, nobody, the government fought hard. It didn't want to establish a precedent that that people who lived near a facility could uh, attribute health effects to that facility and then receive some sort of government compensation. So they fought these lawsuits. Many of the downwinders were ultimately unsuccessful. In other cases, most of the lawsuits, uh, well, the, the vast majority of them were settled, but only after a very long time. In some cases, after the people who filed the lawsuit had died, 
and for far less than the cost that people spent on their health. So it was just a, an, an unsatisfactory experience for most of the people who filed their lawsuits. Perhaps the only thing that they're able to say is, yes, but we made our voices heard. We, we, we uh, told the world about our problems and, uh, and the fact that those problems could be connected to Hanford. And, and that is probably the most important thing that came out of that lawsuit. Just like today, we're commemorating the 75th anniversary of the, of the survivors of the Hiroshima bombing. And those people for 75 years have been telling the rest of the world that we can't allow this to happen again. And to, and to some extent, the downwinders are in the same camp as those survivors of the, of the atomic bomb. Uh, and lastly, is there any type of civilian use for this plutonium or is it just sitting there, you know, uh, basically uh, waiting to be buried at some point? Oh, that's really such an interesting question. And it gets into the, some of the details of the way that you generate nuclear power for electricity. Most of our uh, most of the 500 nuclear reactors around the world that are generating electricity just use uranium. But in the same way that whenever you put uranium into a nuclear reactor, you inevitably generate plutonium. That's just part of the end product of generating heat for electricity. And really, Szilard was the very first person to, to think about this again. He thought about so many things back there, even before the end of World War II. He realized that this plutonium could also be extracted from those devices and be used to produce electricity in what are called fast greeter reactors. And this, and this, people have been arguing about this technology again for decades. Now, the problem with doing that is that when you start extracting plutonium from uranium fuel cells and from power plants, you all of a sudden generate huge quantities of plutonium. And all of that plutonium is susceptible to being misused in bombs. And for that reason, people have turned again, many countries, including the United States, have turned against the use of breeder reactors, but other countries haven't. And the more of this plutonium that exists in the world, the more dangerous the world is. There's a treaty that has been proposed to try to control uranium. It's called the Fissile Materials Cutoff Treaty. And that's proposing that we just don't generate any of these materials that can be used to develop atomic bombs, either the uranium that was used in the Hiroshima bomb or the plutonium used in the Nagasaki bomb. That treaty has not made pr much progress lately, but it's if we're ever going to eliminate nuclear weapons from the world, which we need to do because eventually they'll be used if we don't, that treaty is going to be part of the solution. One can only hope. Uh, Steve Olson, yes. the book is The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age. Thanks so much. We will put a link to that at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Okay, my pleasure.